esteemed guests, Dr. Hamburg, Dr. Salvatierra, Dr. Knox, Dr. Blaschke, Dr. Gesundheit, Dr. Scholes, Dr. Seuss, Dr. Pepper, Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, Dr. Octopus, Dr. J, Dr. Drew, Dr. Dre, Dr. Quinn, medicine woman. Ladies, gentlemen, friends, family, and to the newest doctors, the Stanford School of Medicine class of 2012. today with more debt than Greece, <laughs> unable to afford redundant luxuries like pants underneath an expensive graduation gown, <laughs> and yet still so grateful for the opportunity to bear witness to a transformation. For many of you, this has been a long journey, decades of study. Mike Mancuso and Matt Goldstein have been students here since the Ford administration. <laughs> It's a special day for many of our physician scientists for not only do they get an MD and a PhD today, they also get to enroll in Medicare and collect Social Security. <laughs> but whatever decade we started in, we were asked to go into a room and to interview a patient for the first time. We were humbled by the presence of tears and pain in that room. And when it was over, the patient stood up gave us a hug and said, please stop crying. You're going to be a fun doctor. <laughs> Many of us, we didn't know what to do with 15 minutes, and so we engaged in idle banter. Where are you from? What do you do for a living? Do you come around here much? Men, women, or both? All things you might hear at a local bar. Because we are all medical students, I assure you, this was thoroughly awkward. Years later, though, so much has changed in medicine and at our medical school. You know, when we started medical school, we used a substance called paper and books. And now the kids walk around with their fancy iPads and their angry birds. When we started medical school, the buildings were made out of cardboard, asbestos, and lead. And now, as you can see, they are built out of platinum and powered on the strength of unicorns. <laughs> Two years ago, in the name of student feedback and animal experimentation, our class was guinea pig to a new grading system. It, uh, it's been tweaked a few times, and I'm proud to announce to you today the newest grading system at this distinguished institution. The top grade a student can now get is a smiley face. <laughs> this represents pass with distinction, but still, stay away from the patients. Next, is a face that can neither smile nor frown. This indicates that the student self-injected too much Botox. <laughs> Finally, frowning face means your doctor does not play nice with others. Consider a career in pathology. <laughs> At Harvard. The greatest transformation, of course, is in the people gathered here, soon to be minted physicians and scientists. My classmates are an incredible group of people. We have professional athletes, published authors. Last year, seven Stanford students founded their own companies. Three founded their own medical schools. Two founded their own religions. <laughs> Incredibly, two Stanford students last year learned how to take a blood pressure by hand. <laughs> What makes my classmates truly incredible is not their accomplishments. It is their choice to care, day after day. Graduations rarely celebrate the choice of compassion. From preschool to college, we've been celebrated and praised for our hard work and our talent. Yet in medicine, we oftentimes bring our talent to work, and we work hard. And then we find ourselves, along with our patients, bowing, laying prostrate before luck, a horrible accident, and a barren cell. And then we recognize that while we may be talented, we're really just blessed with the good health to be here, with the resources and the support to be here, lucky to be educated individuals in the most influential country in the most connected world ever. Nobody has had greater choice in what wonderful and horrible things we could do. 
talented people, after all, worked hard to start the subprime crisis and MTV's The Jersey Shore. <laughs> our talents are rather arbitrary. Our choices are not. What we choose to make of our lives and how we choose to treat other people. Our politicians, our society, and even our alma mater will grant us access and privilege based on our proximity to capital. Yet, in the tradition of great caregivers, from mothers, fathers, teachers, nurses, you all have chosen instead proximity to people. You have gone and you've known everything about a disease for rounds, and then, in moments that no one will ever know about, you showed your patients that this disease was the least interesting thing about them. Your hands will welcome new life to this world and will hold on through last breaths. Graduates, your decision to take care of my parents, our sisters and children, today we celebrate your decision to confront suffering. And we especially celebrate those people who have spent their lives showing us the art and science of care. To the faculty, administration, and staff, the good news for you is that according to the original Hippocratic Oath, you as our teachers are entitled to a sum of our earnings from here on, and I am to regard you and your children as family. The bad news for you is that I will now regard you and your children as family. <laughs> Dear Uncle Dean Pizzo, I will be staying on your couch starting Tuesday. Dear Uncle Dean Prober, I need $200,000 and a pair of pants. <laughs> Faculty, in your role as educators, in your role as caregivers, and in your role as people, you have always exemplified for us the roles and virtues of caregivers. It's true, you have caught us when we fell. One of my classmates was in the operating room and after a nine and a half hour surgery, she began to feel lightheaded. She fell backwards into the arms of world-famous surgeon Dr. Jeffrey Norton. With surgical efficiency, he declared, Give her some room! Give her some juice! When she went back to apologize for the incident, she, he said to her, Forget about it! You're an angel! You retracted perfectly! Over and over again, this faculty has chosen to care about us. To our families, defined by blood, experience, and mostly love. You have shown us care even when we may not have deserved it. I learned in medical school that I owe a lot to my parents, namely a horrible lipid profile and a deep fear of male pattern baldness. <laughs> Once, my mother left me a voicemail, and because I was a super busy medical student, it sat unlistened to for days. I went and worked a 30-hour shift and then had a great post-call nap, I was awakened by a loud knock at the door. It was a very friendly Stanford police officer who had received a call from a very angry Indian woman. <laughs> it is truly an act of love and care when your family will call the police on you. <laughs> Families, the sacrifices, the worried hours by the phone, the extra jobs so that we could afford school, gift boxes full of Twizzlers, and journeys across oceans for greater opportunity. We thank you and we hope to honor your sacrifices by allowing a fraction of the love and grace you have shown us to be re-gifted to people who may be in their moment of need. That this community of care has transformed awkward medical students into equally awkward physicians is remarkable. <laughs> and as we began a life of caregiving, we ask you still more. We ask you to remind us, and I pause to remind myself, that in order to care for others, we must care for ourselves, unconditionally. We have all seen physicians who were sad and frustrated. We work in a world and we live in a field that sometimes tells us that we are good, mostly due to a title, a rank, an honor, a fancy Stanford degree. Let us not celebrate the accomplishment alone today. For what when the accomplishment ends, or when they inevitably fail to satisfy? When we don't get this grant or fellowship? When everyone on Facebook has a bigger house, a prettier baby, and a Nobel Prize? <laughs> Our faith and this community 
remind us that it is not our successes that make us great or construct our identity. Let us celebrate us today and every day for the reasons we celebrate this work, for the reasons we celebrate every single patient, our relationships, our brief presence in this moment, and our humanity. Classmates, I do hope we continue to cure disease, solve problems, and help create a world of deeper knowledge, greater justice, and better health. But more importantly, I hope you live lives filled with care, joy, and great relationships. Not as an abdication of the responsibility to improve the world, but as a recognition that perhaps improving the world begins right there, with care, joy, and great relationships. I hope you have wonderful conversations with your colleagues, mentors, and especially your patients. I hope you get to spend a lot of time with your family, friends, and loved ones, such that you really enjoy them, and then more time, such that you find them a little bit boring. And then still more time, such that they're a little bit annoying. <laughs> Mostly, I hope you have great conversations with yourself. Just not so loudly that it scares other people. <laughs> I hope you live out the moments and the lives for yourself that I know you will work so hard to preserve for others. To my classmates and to this community of care, I'm humbled by you and your ridiculous good looks. I thank you for everything. I wish you wonderfully mediocre careers and phenomenal joyful lives.